Hey, it's Matt Decker with Leverage Wealth Management. Today we're going to be talking about something that I've gotten a lot of requests for, and that is how in the world can I retire at the age of 62? What are the impacts and ramifications on my Social Security benefit? And what else do I have to have in order to make that happen? So we're going to tackle that topic today. But first, before we get into it, you have to understand that anytime someone goes through an example like this, it's nearly impossible for me to cover everything in a YouTube video, number one. Number two, it is impossible to make content, evergreen content, that's always applicable and that applies to everybody. So I'm gonna have to make some assumptions. And so I'm gonna make some assumptions based on kind of the, the average person or the typical person uh, that, that I work with, that I do business with, and so, you know, it's, it's going to be the, the case that I see most often. So this person, this hypothetical person, how do I retire at 62? And what are the ramifications of doing that on, on different areas of retirement? We're going to say that they're born in, in 1960, which means their maximum Social Security benefit. So I'm just throwing a key up here in the top right. The maximum Social Security benefit is going to be $3,070 per month. And typically this person, the spouse, has a social security benefit, but typically the spouse is going to collect half of, of the primary earner's social security benefit. Uh, and so they're not gonna collect on their own, they're gonna collect half of the spouses. So we'll just put half of spouse as the other social security benefit. So the main thing that you need to understand is if, if you plan on retiring at 62, the, the traditional way of thinking about financial planning, it looks a little bit like this. It's called like a three bucket approach. So you got three different buckets. They represent three different pots of money. And on the far left hand side, we have social security slash any pensions. Let me make this just a little bit smaller here so it's easier to write. So we got social security and pensions. And then the middle bucket is going to be 401k or IRA, you could think of this as any qualified money, 403B, TSP, SEP, simple, all kinds of examples, but essentially it's, it is tax deferred money, money that is going to be taxed when you take it out. And then the third leg of the stool is just gonna be, uh, let's call it cash slash emergency fund. So money that's set aside in case of emergencies. So let's say that this person wants to retire at age 62. They're born in 1960. What that means is their social security benefit is going to be reduced. Uh, you take it early, it's going to be reduced. It's not 30, 70. It's actually going to be basically 2100, 2150 per month. And then a half of that benefit is going to be, uh, let's call it $990 for the spouse. So all told, their social security benefit filing at age 62 is gonna be $38,000 between husband and wife. So $38,000 husband and wife. That's what they're getting every single year. Now, most people will come in and they'll say something along the lines of, you know, I think I can live off 60 or $70,000 a year, but I'd like a little bit of a cushion. So what we're going to shoot for is $90,000 a year of income uh, every single year. And you can index that for inflation as well. And so a traditional financial planner, they're going to work backwards from this point on. And they're going to say, okay, well, if you need $98,000 a year, what that means is from this 401k slash IRA pot of money, we're going to need to take out $52,000 a year. 52 plus 38 gets us to 90. Now remember, we're working backwards. So most financial planners are going to use something called a 4 to 5% withdrawal rule, which means they have to grow your money and then they're just going to take out 4 to 5% per year as income. So if we use that 4 to 5% withdrawal rule, and let's just stick with 5%, what that basically means is in this IRA slash 401k pot of money, we need about a million dollars in here. We have a million dollars in here. Most financial planners will say you can get out around $50,000 per year. And let's say that you've got six months 
over here in cash slash emergency fund. So you want to retire at age 62, you need $90,000 a year. Well, you got a maximum social security benefit your wife's going to take or your spouse is going to take half of that maximum social security benefit. So you got 38 from social security, you need about a million dollar IRA to kick off $52,000 a year. Now, there's two major things. So this is the traditional way to do financial planning. There are two massive, massive holes in strategizing in this way. So I made a little room for myself to, to write these two massive holes. I got rid of cash because that's just kind of a constant six months emergency expenses. Uh, but what are the two major holes in this traditional three-legged stool approach? Well, number one, there's virtually no accounting for taxes. Okay, so that's number one. And then number two, in this particular strategy, there's virtually no discussion of market risk or market volatility, let's call it. So let's tackle these one at a time. Let's start with taxes. The first thing that you have to understand is something called provisional income. We'll just put PI, provisional income. Provisional income is a calculation that determines whether or not your social security is going to be taxed. So it's an important calculation. You should know what it is. Right now, the provisional income sits at the threshold, sits at $44,000. So what that means is you have $44,000 of income if you're married filing jointly. 85% of this social security benefit is going to be subject to tax. 85% subject to tax. Now, what counts as provisional income? Well, all of your withdrawals from 401ks and IRAs is going to count. All your 1099s are going to count. Any earned income is going to count. And half of your social security benefit is also going to count towards provisional income. So you can see we're way above the $44,000 just on our $52,000 alone. So what that means is 85% of our social security benefit is going to tax. And the entire $52,000 withdrawal from our 401k is also going to be taxed. So we're taking out 90 grand, but really what we're going to be left with is something more like, let's call it 85 to $87,000. And so taxes are just not taken into account with this traditional three-legged stool financial planning approach. And really, you know, if this provisional income number is the nut that we're trying to stay under, you know, what if we could utilize other vehicles besides qualified accounts in order to make sure that that this $52,000 is coming from a tax-free source of income? Think Roth IRA. Well, if we had $52,000 coming from a Roth IRA, we would be way under the $44,000 provisional income threshold, which would mean that our social security benefit would not be taxable. And that can be a huge deal when you're talking about retirement dollars. So you have to absolutely take into account taxes when it comes to uh, financial planning, and specifically, if you want to retire early, you have to understand how retiring early is going to have an effect on provisional income and whether or not your Social Security will be taxable. So the other thing that this particular way of doing financial planning does not account for in the least bit is market volatility. And so the reason that we're talking about this is because, again, as a refresher, this $52,000 is basically using that 4 to 5% withdrawal rule. This has been a rule that's been around for a really long time. Uh, it's been used for a long time. The problem with it is it's based on something that's totally uncontrollable. This 4 to 5% withdrawal rule is based on something totally uncontrollable, and that is known as sequence of returns sequence of returns. And the upshot here is this 4 to 5% withdrawal rule has about a 20 to 30% fail rate, meaning people that utilize this strategy, 20 to 30% of those people run out of money before they die. Why? Because of sequence of return risk because of sequence of return risk. All right, so what the heck is sequence of return risk? Well, to understand sequence of return risk, you have to understand a couple different things. First, you have to understand the difference between the geometric mean 
and the average. So we're going to start with average because the reason that people use financial planners use this four to five percent withdrawal rule is because they'll say things like, hey, on this pot of money, we have got an average rate of return of 8% over the last 15 years. That's our average rate of return. And it's important that you understand that average rate of return really means absolutely nothing. And I'm going to prove that to you right now. So I'm going to give you four numbers and I want you to give me the average and I promise you, you're going to be able to do it. Here it goes. Negative 10%, positive 10%, negative 10%, positive 10%. What's our average? Well, it doesn't take a genius to understand that our average is 0%, right? Okay, so if I was a money manager quoting you my average rate of return for the last four years, and this is what I had, negative 10, positive 10, negative 10, positive 10, I could tell you my average rate of return is 0%. And you'd say, well, Matt, that sucks. Why would I ever do business with you? And I totally understand. But the problem is, the problem is, as soon as you add money to this conversation, average rate of return really doesn't mean anything. Average rate of return doesn't mean anything as soon as you add money to this conversation. So let's say that we start with $100,000, okay? We start with $100,000 and then we experience the exact same sequence of returns. What happens? Okay, let's go through it. Negative 10% we now have $90,000, right? $100,000 minus 10%, $90,000. Positive 10%, we now have $99,000 minus 10%. We now have $89,100 plus 10%. We now have 98 and $10, okay? So over the same four years, my average rate of return was 0%, but my actual internal rate of return was negative 1.99%, basically negative 2%. Negative 2% 2 versus zero. Okay, so why does this matter? This absolutely illustrates sequence of return risk with numbers that are not all that drastic, okay? Numbers that are not all that drastic. What this should tell you is that losing money hurts more than making money helps. So let's do this all over again, but let's use more drastic numbers. Well, four numbers, but we're just gonna make it a little bit more intense. So instead of negative 10, Let's use negative 25, negative 25%, positive 25%, negative 25%, positive 25%. What's my average rate of return as a money manager? It's zero and you're doing business elsewhere. But let's put the same dollar amount to it and do the exact same exercise. Start with $100,000 minus 25%. We now have $75,000 plus 25%, we now have 93,750. Minus 25%, we now have 70,312. Plus 25%, we now have 87,890. 87,890. So over four years, now our internal rate of return is actually negative 12.1%, negative 12.1% internal rate of return, even though our average was a zero. Again, losing money hurts more than making money helps. Okay, so let's bring this full circle because what the heck does sequence of returns have to do with traditional financial planning and have to do with this $52,000 that we're trying to take out of this qualified account? You know, we're trying to get the 52 out of the million. What in the world? Why does all this matter? Why is this important? Why are we talking about it? Well, the four to five percent withdrawal rule has that 20 to 30 percent fail rate. Remember, 20 to 30 percent fail rate. The reason it has a 20 to 30% fail rate is let's say that everything goes perfect, okay? Everything goes great. 
you don't have any big losses at the beginning of your retirement. That's basically what this is assuming. No big losses at the beginning of your retirement. 25 years down the road, if you're taking out this $52,000 from this million dollar portfolio, this is a Monte Carlo simulation. So it runs 10,000 different scenarios and it tells you the likelihood that this strategy actually works. Well, 25 years down the road, 89% of the people that go through with this strategy under conditions where you don't have any big losses at the beginning of your retirement, they still have money left over. They're fine. 89% of the people are fine under hunky-dory, normal conditions with no big losses at the beginning. Okay, well, 89% is a whole heck of a lot better than you know 70% if it's a 30% fail rate. Check this out, though. If you have two bad years, two bad years to start your retirement, two bad years in the market to start your retirement with your million dollars, your success rate goes from 89% all the way down to 54% after 25 years. A huge, massive drop in the success rate of being able to take out this $52,000 from your million dollar portfolio and live off of 90 in retirement. I'm gonna say all that again because it's so important and yet sometimes it's difficult to sink in. The only thing that changed in this scenario is we took a 25 year stretch of time and said, we don't want to have any losses in the first several years of retirement. 89% of the people that go through with the strategy succeed. In the second scenario, we said, okay, well, instead of assuming no losses in the first several years, what if we do have two bad years at the start of retirement? It takes the success rate from 89% all the way down to 54% just by adding two bad years at the start of retirement. So here's the payoff question. Here's the question every single person should be asking if they intend to use this four to 5% withdrawal rule. What are the first several years of your retirement going to look like in terms of market volatility? What are the first several years of your retirement going to look like in terms of market volatility? The only correct answer is that you have absolutely no idea. Nobody does. If they tell you that they do, you should run away from that person because nobody knows what the first several years of your retirement are going to look like. I ask everybody this question that comes through some of the educational courses that we do here in the Atlanta area. And I say, hey, do you think anybody retired in 1998 or 1999 and everybody looks at me like I'm stupid and I, well yeah of course Some people retired in 1998 and 1999 come on why why would you even ask that question the reason that I asked that question is because what happened to the stock market in the year 2000 2001 and 2002 what happened in those 3 years 2000 2001 2002 well we had 3 pretty bad years in a row we had a negative 10% in the year 2000 we had a negative 13% in the year 2001, and we had a negative 23% in the year 2002. What in the world do you think these three years, what kind of impact are they going to have on the 4 to 5% withdrawal crowd? What kind of impact? A devastating impact. Why? Because they had three bad years right in a row, right at the start of their retirement. And guess what? If you're retired, you still have bills to pay. You still have bills to pay, which means just because the market is down doesn't mean you don't have to pay your bills, right? If you have to take out $52,000 from your IRA accounts, the stock market doesn't care, right? If it's down 23%, you still have to take out your 52 grand to pay your bills or whatever the number may be. And taking money out of an account that has just lost money is a compounding downward spiral effect that is nearly impossible from a mathematical standpoint to get out of. Do you think anybody retired in 2007? Why am I asking? Well, you know why I'm asking. Because in 2008, we got a negative 38%. You think that has an impact on the 4 to 5% withdrawal crowd? 
Absolutely it does. How much of an impact does it have? A huge one. Why? Because if you lose 38% in order to get back to even, if you have that same $100,000 example, you lose 38% in order to get back to even, you have to gain around 62% just to get back to your original $100,000. So yeah, 2008, 2000 to 2002 had massive negative implications for all those people that were hoping to just simply use this four to 5% withdrawal rule. So again, the question becomes, what are the first several years of your retirement going to look like? Are they going to look like any of these years? You have no idea. Is it going to look like 2003, positive 26? Is it going to look like 2009, positive 23? Is it going to look like 2013, positive 29? Is it going to look like 2018, negative 6? You, know, you just don't know. What about 1981, negative 9? 1977, negative 12. You don't know what the first several years of your retirement are going to look like. And so this 4 to 5% withdrawal rule is inherently risky because there's a variable that you cannot control just by simply putting your money into some 60-40 blend, 70-30 blend, closing your eyes and hoping the stock market cooperates. Because guess what? The stock market doesn't care if you're retiring or not. It's going to do what it's going to do regardless of what your plans are. So you want to retire at 62. You got all these risks that aren't factored into traditional financial planning. How in the world do you make this work? Well, let me show you how you make this work. So we got the same first two buckets, social security slash pension. We'll keep the same $38,000 in there because you're filing for your benefit early. And remember, you got the max social security benefit. It's just a sample born in 1960. Okay, just a sample. If you, if you want to know how this is going to work for you, you're going to have to contact me because I can't do it on YouTube. Uh, the second one is going to be that IRA bucket, or basically we'll call it the tax deferred bucket, the TD bucket. Uh, and what we basically have to do to account for these two things is we have to add a third or rather a fourth. We'll still have our cash over here, six months. We have to add a fourth category. And this fourth category is very simply just principal protection. It's principal protection. Why? Because we can use the four to 5% withdrawal rule on this bucket of money as long as we have a significant portion of your money in a bucket that is principal protected, meaning when the stock market does a 2000 to 2002, negative 10, negative 10, negative you know, 20, when it does that, you have a bucket of income that's got money in it that's not going to go backwards. And so here's what it's gonna look like. Let's say that you've got the same million dollars, but we've just split it up. You got 500,000 here in market linked accounts. You got $500,000 here in principal protected accounts. So let's say that the market is up 30%. Okay, well you might take the majority of your 52 grand from this bucket right here. Let's say that the market is down 32%. We're not gonna to touch our market linked accounts. Why? Because withdrawing money after market losses is suicidal. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the majority of our $52,000 from this account here that has principal protection in place. We're going to let this account rebound. And so every single year we're shifting where the dollars come from in order to account for market volatility. That is the way that you beat the sequence of return risk. That's how you beat the sequence of return risk. You have to have a principal protection plan. Now, how do we beat the tax issue? Because we talked about taxes as being another issue. Well, we love to inside the, the principal protection plan, we love to stash things like Roth IRAs. So not only can we be taking, and we'll do it here too, transition some of this to Roth accounts, we love that because not only do we get principal protection, but now we've also got tax-free dollars. And if in, in the case of, let's say the market's down and all of our money comes out of this bucket and it's coming from a Roth and we've got 38 here, remember that figure that we were trying to stay under, provisional income, $44,000? In this scenario, this is all tax-free and it doesn't count towards provisional income, which means nothing's taxable in this year. What if we could make that happen every single year? Man, that's an ideal scenario. The reality is most financial planners don't do this because it takes a whole heck of a lot of work. If you're interested in learning more about principal protection, 
If you're interested in learning more about sequence of return risk, if you're interested in learning more about uh, social security taxation, or just in general, how to generate more tax-free dollars, here's what you need to do. You need to click on the call out card above. It's gonna take you directly to my website where you can apply for just a real quick 30 minute discovery call where we talk about this. You get to ask several questions, clarifying questions, uh, we can we can get to know your situation and see if something like this is going to be feasible for you. So you can either click on that call out card above or you can go to my website, leveragedwm.com slash triple P, principal protection plan, triple P, leveragedwm.com slash triple P. Book a 30 minute discovery call with me and we'll find out if this is something that's going to be right for you. Let me know what you thought of this video. Let me know what questions you have. Thanks so much for joining me. I know that this was a longer one than normal, but there's a lot of information here. I tried to make it as comprehensive as I could without making it a two hour long video. And of course, your situation is absolutely going to be different. So book that discovery call. We can talk about your situation, your numbers, and see if a principal protection plan is going to be right for you. This has been Matt Decker leverage wealth management if you haven't already done so like this video subscribe to my channel so you can stay up to date on all future content that i come out with in the world of cash value life insurance and financial planning thanks so much and we'll see you next time